727. Ah. Friend of my soul, instantly exclaimed the other shepherdess, what great good fortune has befallen us. Sayest thou this gentleman we have before us? Well then let me tell thee he is the most valiant, and the most devoted, and the most courteous gentleman in all the world, unless a history of his achievements that has been printed, and I have read is telling lies and deceiving us. I will lay a wager that this good fellow, who is with him is one Sancho Panza his squire, whose drolleries none can equal. That's true, said Sancho, I am that same droll and squire you speak of, and this gentleman is my master Don Quixote of La Mancha, the same that's in the history, and that they talk about. Oh my friend, said the other, let us entreat him to stay, for it will give our fathers and brothers infinite pleasure. I too have heard just what thou hast told me of the valor of the one and the drolleries of the other, and what is more, of him they say that he is the most constant and loyal lover that was ever heard of, and that his lady is one Dulcinea del Toboso, to whom all over Spain the palm of beauty is awarded. And justly awarded, said Don Quixote, unless, indeed, your unequaled beauty makes it a matter of doubt. But spare yourselves the trouble, ladies, of pressing me to stay, for the urgent calls of my profession do not allow me to take rest under any circumstances. At this instant there came up to the spot where the four stood a brother of one of the two shepherdesses, like them in shepherd costume, and as richly and gaily dressed as they were. They told him that their companion was the valiant Don Quixote of La Mancha, and the other Sancho was squire, of whom he knew already from having read their history. The gay shepherd offered him his services and begged that he would accompany him to their tents, and Don Quixote had to give way and comply. And now the gave was started, and the nets were filled with a variety of birds that deceived by the color fell into the danger they were flying from. Upwards of thirty persons, all gaily attired as shepherds and shepherdesses, assembled on the spot, and were at once informed who Don Quixote and his squire were, whereat they were not a little delighted, as they knew of him already through his history. They repaired to the tents where they found tables laid out, and choicely, plentifully, and neatly furnished. They treated Don Quixote as a person of distinction, giving him the place of honor, and all observed him, and were full of astonishment at the spectacle. At last the cloth being removed, Don Quixote with great composure lifted up his voice and said, One of the greatest sins that men are guilty of is minus some will say pride minus, but I say in gratitude, going by the common saying that hell is full of ingrates. This sin, so far as it has lain in my power, I have endeavored to avoid ever since I have enjoyed the faculty of reason, and if I am unable to requite good deeds that have been done me by other deeds, I substitute the desire to do so, and if that be not enough I make them known publicly, for he who declares, and makes known the good deeds done to him would repay them by others if it were in his power, and for the most part those who receive are the inferiors of those who. Don Quixote Chapter 58-728 Give Thus, God is superior to all because he is the supreme giver, and the offerings of man fall short by an infinite distance of being a full return for the gifts of God, but gratitude in some degree makes up for this deficiency and shortcoming. I therefore, grateful for the favor that has been extended to me here, and unable to make a return in the same measure, restricted as I am by the narrow limits of my power, offer what I can and what I have to offer in my own way, and so I declare that for two full days I will maintain in the middle of this highway leading to Saragossa, that these ladies disguised as shepherdesses, who are here present, are the fairest and most courteous maidens in the world, excepting only the peerless. Dulcinea del Toboso, sole mistress of my thoughts, be it said without offense to those who hear me, ladies and gentlemen. On hearing this Sancho, who had been listening with great attention, cried out in a loud voice, Is it possible there is anyone in the world who will dare to say and swear that this master of mine is a madman? Say, gentlemen shepherds, is there a village priest, be he ever so wise or learned, who could say what my master has said, or is there knight minus errant, whatever renown he may have as a man of valor, that could offer what my master has offered now? Don Quixote turned upon Sancho, and with a countenance glowing with anger said to him, is it possible, Sancho, there is anyone in the whole world who will say thou art not a fool, with a lining to match, and I know not what trimmings of impertinence and roguery? Who asked thee to meddle in my affairs, or to inquire whether I am a wise man or a blockhead? Hold thy peace, answer me not a word, saddle Rocinante if he be unsaddled, and let us go to put my offer into execution, for with the right that I have on my side thou mayest reckon as vanquished all who shall venture to question it, and in a great rage, and showing his anger plainly, he rose from his seat leaving the company lost in wonder, and making them feel doubtful whether they ought to regard him as a madman or a rational being. In the end, though they sought to dissuade him from involving himself in such a challenge, 
assuring him they admitted his gratitude as fully established and needed no fresh proofs to be convinced of his valiant spirit, as those related in the history of his exploits were sufficient. Still, Don Quixote persisted in his resolve and mounted on Rocinante, bracing his buckler on his arm and grasping his lance, he posted himself in the middle of a high road that was not far from the green meadow. Sancho followed on Dapple, together with all the members of the pastoral gathering, eager to see what would be the upshot of his vainglorious and extraordinary proposal. Don Quixote then, and having, as has been said, planted himself in the middle of the road, made the welkin ring with words to this effect, Ho ye travelers and wayfarers, knights, squires, folk on foot or on horseback, who pass this way or shall pass in the course of the next two days. Know that Don Quixote of La Mancha, knight minus errant, is posted here to maintain by arms that the beauty and courtesy enshrined in the nymphs that dwell in these meadows and groves surpass all upon earth, putting aside the lady of my heart, Dulcinea del Toboso. Wherefore, let him who is of the opposite opinion come on, for here I await him. Don Quixote Chapter 58 729 Twice he repeated the same words, and twice they fell unheard by any adventurer, but fate, that was guiding affairs for him from better to better, so ordered it that shortly afterwards there appeared on the road a crowd of men on horseback, many of them with lances in their hands, all riding in a compact body, and in great haste. No sooner had those who were with Don Quixote seen them than they turned about and withdrew to some distance from the road, for they knew that if they stayed some harm might come to them, but Don Quixote with intrepid heart stood his ground, and Sancho Panza shielded himself with Rocinante's hind minus quarters. The troop of lancers came up, and one of them who was in advance began shouting to Don Quixote, Get out of the way, you son of the devil, or these bulls will knock you to pieces. Rabble, returned Don Quixote, I care nothing for bulls, be they the fiercest Jarama breeds on its banks. Confess at once, scoundrels, that what I have declared is true, else ye have to deal with me in combat. The herdsman had no time to reply nor Don Quixote to get out of the way even if he wished, and so the drove of fierce bulls and tame bullocks, together with the crowd of herdsmen and others who were taking them to be penned up in a village where they were to be run the next day, passed over Don Quixote and over Sancho, Rocinante and Dapple, hurling them all to the earth and rolling them over on the ground. Sancho was left crushed, Don Quixote scared, Dapple belabored and Rocinante in no very sound condition. They all got up however, at length, and Don Quixote in great haste, stumbling here and falling there, started off running after the drove, shouting out, Hold! Stay! Ye rascally rabble, a single knight awaits you, and he is not of the temper or opinion of those who say, for a flying enemy make a bridge of silver. The retreating party in their haste however, did not stop for that, or heed his menaces any more than last year's clouds. Weariness brought dawn. Quixote to a halt, and more enraged than avenged he sat down on the road to wait until. Sancho, Rocinante and Dapple came up. When they reached him master and man mounted once more, and without going back to bid farewell to the mock or imitation Arcadia, and more in humiliation than contentment, they continued their journey. Don Quixote Chapter 58 730 Chapter 59 Wherein is related the strange thing, which may be regarded as an adventure, that happened Don Quixote. A clear limpid spring which they discovered in a cool grove relieved Don Quixote and Sancho of the dust and fatigue due to the unpolite behavior of the bulls, and by the side of this, having turned Dapple and Rocinante loose without headstall or bridle, the forlorn pair, master and man, seated themselves. Sancho had recourse to the larder of his alforwas and took out of them what he called the prog. Don Quixote rinsed his mouth and bathed his face, by which cooling process his flagging energies were revived. Out of pure vexation he remained without eating, and out of pure politeness Sancho did not venture to touch a morsel of what was before him, but waited for his master to act as taster. Seeing however that, absorbed in thought, he was forgetting to carry the bread to his mouth, he said never a word, and trampling every sort of good breeding underfoot, began to stow away in his paunch the bread and cheese that came to his hand. Eat, Sancho my friend, said Don Quixote, support life which is of more consequence to thee than to me, and leave me to die under the pain of my thoughts and pressure of my misfortunes. I was born, Sancho, to live dying, and thou to die eating, and to prove the truth of what I say, look at me, printed in histories, famed in arms, courteous in behavior, 
honored by princes, courted by maidens, and after all, when I looked forward to palms, triumphs, and crowns, won and earned by my valiant deeds, I have this morning seen myself trampled on, kicked, and crushed by the feet of unclean and filthy animals. This thought blunts my teeth, paralyzes my jaws, cramps my hands, and robs me of all appetite for food, so much, so that I have a mind to let myself die of hunger, the cruelest death of all deaths. So then, said Sancho, munching hard all the time, your worship does not agree with the proverb that says, let Martha die, but let her die with a full belly. I, at any rate, have no mind to kill myself, so far from that, I mean to do as the cobbler does, who stretches the leather with his teeth until he makes it reach as far as he wants. I'll stretch out my life by eating until it reaches the end heaven has fixed for it, and let me tell you, senor, there's no greater folly than to think of dying of despair as your worship does. Take my advice, and after eating lie down and sleep a bit on this green grass minus mattress, and you will see that when you awake you'll feel something better. Don Quixote did as he recommended, for it struck him that Sancho's reasoning was more like a philosopher's than a blockhead's, and said he's Sancho, if thou wilt do for me what I am going to tell thee my ease of mind would be more assured and my heaviness of. Don Quixote Chapter 59 731 Heart not so great, and it is this, to go aside a little while I am sleeping in accordance with thy advice, and, making bare thy carcass to the air, to give thyself three or four hundred lashes with Rocinante's reins, on account of the three thousand and odd thou art to give thyself for the disenchantment of Dulcinea, for it is a great pity that the poor lady should be left enchanted through thy carelessness and negligence. There is a good deal to be said on that point, said Sancho. Let us both go to sleep now, and after that, God has decreed what will happen. Let me tell your worship that for a man to whip himself in cold blood is a hard thing, especially if the stripes fall upon an ill-nourished and worse-fed body. Let my lady Dulcinea have patience, and when she is least expecting it, she will see me made a riddle of with whipping, and until death it's all life. I mean that I have still life in me, and the desire to make good what I have promised. Don Quixote thanked him, and ate a little, and Sancho a good deal, and then they both lay down to sleep leaving those two inseparable friends and comrades, Rocinante and Dapple, to their own devices, and to feed unrestrained upon the abundant grass with which the meadow was furnished. They woke up rather late, mounted once more and resumed their journey, pushing on to reach an inn which was in sight, apparently a league off. I say an inn because Don Quixote called it so, contrary to his usual practice of calling all inns castles. They reached it, and asked the landlord if they could put up there. He said yes, with as much comfort and as good fare as they could find in Saragossa. They dismounted, and Sancho stowed away his larder in a room of which the landlord gave him the key. He took the beasts to the stable, fed them, and came back to see what orders Don Quixote, who was seated on a bench at the door, had for him, giving special thanks to heaven that this inn had not been taken for a castle by his master. Supper minus time came and they repaired to their room, and Sancho asked the landlord what he had to give them for supper. To this the landlord replied that his mouth should be the measure, he had only to ask what he would, for that in was provided with the birds of the air, and the fowls of the earth and the fish of the sea. There's no need of all that, said Sancho, if they'll roast us a couple of chickens we'll be satisfied, for my master is delicate and eats little, and I'm not over and above gluttonous. The landlord replied he had no chickens, for the kites had stolen them. Well then, said Sancho, let's send your landlord tell them to roast a pullet, so that it is a tender one. Pullet. My father, said the landlord, indeed and in truth it's only yesterday I sent over fifty to the city to sell, but saving pullets ask what you will. In that case, said Sancho, you will not be without veal or kid. Don Quixote. Chapter 59 732 just now, said the landlord, there's none in the house, for it's all finished, but next week there will he enough and to spare. Much good that does us, said Sancho, I'll lay a bet that all these short minus comings are going to wind up in plenty of bacon and eggs. By God, said the landlord, my guest's wits must he precious dull, I tell him I have neither pullets nor hens, and he wants me to have eggs. Talk of other dainties, if you please, and don't ask for hens again. Body o me, said Sancho, let's settle the matter, say at once what you have got, and let us have no more words about it. In truth and earnest, senor guest, said the landlord, all I have is a couple of cow minus heels like calves feet, or a couple of calves feet like cow heels, they are boiled with chick minus peas, onions, and bacon, and at this moment they are crying come eat me, come eat me. 
I marked them for mine on the spot, said Sancho. Let nobody touch them. I'll pay better for them than anyone else, for I could not wish for anything more to my taste, and I don't care a pin whether they are feet or heels. Nobody shall touch them, said the landlord, for the other guests I have, being persons of high quality, bring their own cook and caterer and larder with them. If you come to people of quality, said Sancho, there's nobody more so than my master, but the calling he follows does not allow of larders or store minus rooms, we lay ourselves down in the middle of a meadow, and fill ourselves with acorns or meddlers. Here ended Sancho's conversation with the landlord, Sancho not caring to carry it any farther by answering him, for he had already asked him what calling or what profession it was his master was of. Supper minus time having come, then, Don Quixote betook himself to his room, the landlord brought in the stew minus pen just as it was, and he sat himself down to sup very resolutely. It seems that in another room, which was next to Don Quixote's, with nothing but a thin partition to separate it, he overheard these words, As you live, Senor Don Geronimo, while they are bringing supper, let us read another chapter of the second part of Don Quixote of La Mancha. The instant Don Quixote heard his own name be started to his feet and listened with open ears to catch what they said about him, and heard the Don Geronimo who had been addressed say in reply, Why would you have us read that absurd stuff, Don Juan, when it is? Don Quixote Chapter 59733 Impossible for anyone who has read the first part of the history of Don Quixote of La Mancha to take any pleasure in reading this second part? For all that, said he who was addressed as Don Juan, we shall do well to read it, for there is no book so bad, but it has something good in it. What displeases me most in it is that it represents Don Quixote as now cured of his love for Dulcinea del Toboso. On hearing this Don Quixote, full of wrath and indignation, lifted up his voice and said, Whoever he may be who says that Don Quixote of La Mancha has forgotten or can forget Dulcinea del Toboso, I will teach him with equal arms that what he says is very far from the truth. For neither can the peerless Dulcinea del Toboso be forgotten, nor can forgetfulness have a place in Don Quixote, his motto is constancy, and his profession to maintain the same with his life and never wrong it. Who is this that answers us? said they in the next room. Who should it be, said Sancho, but Don Quixote of La Mancha himself, who will make good all he has said and all he will say, for pledges don't trouble a good payer. Sancho had hardly uttered these words when two gentlemen, for such they seemed to be, entered the room, and one of them, throwing his arms round Don Quixote's neck, said to him, Your appearance cannot leave any question as to your name, nor can your name fail to identify your appearance. Unquestionably, senor, you are the real Don Quixote of La Mancha, sinusure and morning star of night minus errantry, despite and in defiance of him who has sought to usurp your name and bring to naught your achievements, as the author of this book which I hear present to you has done, and with this he put a book which his companion carried into the hands of Don Quixote, who took it, and without replying began to run his eye over it, but he presently returned it saying, In the little I have seen I have discovered three things in this author that deserve to be censured. The first is some words that I have read in the preface, the next that the language is Aragonese, for sometimes he writes without articles, and the third, which above all stamps him as ignorant, is that he goes wrong and departs from the truth in the most important part of the history, for here he says that my squire Sancho Panza's wife is called Mari Gutierrez, when she is called nothing of the sort, but Teresa Panza, and when a man errs on such an important point as this there is good reason to fear that he is in error on every other point in the history. A nice sort of historian, indeed, exclaimed Sancho at this. He must know a deal about our affairs when he calls my wife Teresa Panza, Mari Gutierrez. Take the book again, senor, and see if I am in it, and if he has changed my name. From your talk, friend, said Don Geronimo, no doubt you are Sancho Panza, senor Don Quixote Squire. Don Quixote Chapter 59 734 Yes, I am, said Sancho, and I'm proud of it. Faith, then, said the gentleman, this new author does not handle you with the decency that displays itself in your person. He makes you out a heavy feeder and a fool, and not in the least droll, and a very different being from the Sancho described in the first part of your master's history. God forgive him, said Sancho. He might have left me in my corner without troubling his head about me. Let him who knows how ring the bells. St. Peter is very well in Rome. The two gentlemen pressed Don Quixote to come into their room and have supper with them as they knew very well there was nothing in that unfit for one of his sort. Don Quixote, who was always polite, yielded to their request and supped with them. 
Sancho stayed behind with the stew. And invested with plenary delegated authority seated himself at the head of the table, and the landlord sat down with him, for he was no less fond of cow minus heel and calf's feet than Sancho was. While at supper Don Juan asked Don Quixote what news he had of the Lady Dulcinea del Toboso, was she married, had she been brought to bed, or was she with child, or did she in maidenhood, still preserving her modesty and delicacy, cherish the remembrance of the tender passion of Senor Don Quixote? To this he replied, Dulcinea is a maiden still, and my passion more firmly rooted than ever, our intercourse unsatisfactory as before, and her beauty transformed into that of a foul country wench, and then he proceeded to give them a full and particular account of the enchantment of Dulcinea, and of what had happened him in the cave of Montesinos, together with what the sage Merlin had prescribed for her disenchantment, namely the scourging of Sancho. Exceedingly great was the amusement the two gentlemen derived from hearing Don Quixote recount the strange incidents of his history, and if they were amazed by his absurdities they were equally amazed by the elegant style in which he delivered them. On the one hand they regarded him as a man of wit and sense, and on the other he seemed to them a maundering blockhead, and they could not make up their minds whereabouts between wisdom and folly they ought to place him. Sancho having finished his supper, and left the landlord in the ex-condition, repaired to the room where his master was, and as he came and said, May I die, sirs, if the author of this book your worships have got has any mind that we should agree, as he calls me glutton, according to what your worships say, I wish he may not call me drunkard too. Don Quixote Chapter 59-735 But he does, said Don Geronimo, I cannot remember however, in what way, though I know his words are offensive, and what is more, lying, as I can see plainly by the physiognomy of the worthy Sancho before me. Believe me, said Sancho, the Sancho and the Don Quixote of this history must be different persons from those that appear in the one side Hammy Benengeli wrote, who are ourselves, my master valiant, wise, and true in love, and I simple, droll, and neither glutton nor drunkard. I believe it, said Don Juan, and were it possible, an order should be issued that no one should have the presumption to deal with anything relating to Don Quixote, save his original author side Hamid, just as Alexander commanded that no one should presume to paint his portrait save Apelles. Let him who will paint me, said Don Quixote, but let him not abuse me, for patience will often break down when they heap insults upon it. None can be offered to Senor Don Quixote, said Don Juan, that he himself will not be able to avenge, if he does not ward it off with the shield of his patience which, I take it, is great and strong. A considerable portion of the night passed in conversation of this sort, and though Don Juan wished Don Quixote to read more of the book to see what it was all about, he was not to be prevailed upon, saying that he treated it as read and pronounced it utterly silly, and if by any chance it should come to its author's ears that he had it in his hand, he did not want him to flatter himself with the idea that he had read it, for our thoughts, and still more our eyes, should keep themselves aloof from what is obscene and filthy. They asked him whether he meant to direct his steps. He replied, to Saragossa, to take part in the harness justs which were held in that city every year. Don Juan told him that the new history described how Don Quixote, let him be who he might, took part there in a tilting at the ring, utterly devoid of invention, poor in mottos, very poor in costume, though rich in sillinesses. For that very reason, said Don Quixote, I will not set foot in Saragossa, and by that means I shall expose to the world the lie of this new history writer, and people will see that I am not the Don Quixote he speaks of. You will do quite right, said Don Geronimo, and there are other justs at Barcelona in which Senor Don Quixote may display his prowess. That is what I mean to do, said Don Quixote, and as it is now time, I pray your worships to give me leave to retire to bed, and to place and retain me among the number of. Don Quixote Chapter 59-736 Your greatest friends and servants And me too, said Sancho, maybe I'll be good for something. With this they exchanged farewells, and Don Quixote and Sancho retired to their room, leaving Don Juan and Don Geronimo amazed to see the medley he made of his good sense and his craziness, and they felt thoroughly convinced that these, and not those their Aragonese author described, were the genuine Don Quixote and Sancho. Don Quixote rose betimes, and bade adieu to his hosts by knocking at the partition of the other room. Sancho paid the landlord magnificently, and recommended him either to say less about the providing of his inn, or to keep it better provided. Don Quixote Chapter 59-737 Chapter 60 
of what happened Don Quixote on his way to Barcelona. It was a fresh morning giving promise of a cool day as Don Quixote quitted the inn, first of all taking care to ascertain the most direct road to Barcelona without touching upon Saragossa, so anxious was he to make out this new historian, who they said abused him so, to be a liar. Well, as it fell out, nothing worthy of being recorded happened him for six days, at the end of which, having turned aside out of the road, he was overtaken by night in a thicket of oak or cork trees, for on this point side Hamid is not as precise as he usually is on other matters. Master and man dismounted from their beasts, and as soon as they had settled themselves at the foot of the trees, Sancho, who had had a good noontide meal that day, let himself, without more ado, pass the gates of sleep. But Don Quixote, whom his thoughts, far more than hunger, kept awake, could not close an eye, and roamed in fancy to and fro through all sorts of places. At one moment it seemed to him that he was in the cave of Montesinos, and saw Dulcinea, transformed into a country wench, skipping and mounting upon her she minus ass, again that the words of the sage Merlin were sounding in his ears, setting forth the conditions to be observed and the exertions to be made for the disenchantment of Dulcinea. He lost all patience when he considered the laziness and want of charity of his squire Sancho, for to the best of his belief he had only given himself five lashes, a number paltry and disproportioned to the vast number required. At this thought he felt such vexation and anger that he reasoned the matter thus, if Alexander the Great cut the Gordian knot. Saying, to cut comes to the same thing as to untie, and yet did not fail to become Lord Paramount of all Asia, neither more nor less could happen now in Dulcinea's disenchantment if I scourge Sancho against his will, for, if it is the condition of the remedy that Sancho shall receive three thousand and odd lashes, what does it matter to me whether he inflicts them himself, or someone else inflicts them, when the essential point is that he receives them, let them come from whatever quarter they may. With this idea he went over to Sancho, having first taken Rocinante's reins and arranged them so as to be able to flog him with them, and began to untie the points, the common belief is he had but one in front, by which his breeches were held up, but the instant he approached him Sancho woke up in his full senses and cried out, what is this? Who is touching me and untrussing me? It is I, said Don Quixote, and I come to make good thy shortcomings and relieve my own distresses. I come to whip thee, Sancho, and wipe off some portion of the debt thou hast undertaken. Dulcinea is perishing, thou art living on regardless, I am dying of hope deferred. Don Quixote Chapter 6738 Therefore untrust thyself with a good will, for mine it is, here, in this retired spot, to give thee at least two thousand lashes. Not a bit of it, said Sancho, let your worship keep quiet, or else by the living God the deaf shall hear us. The lashes I pledged myself to must be voluntary and not forced upon me, and just now I have no fancy to whip myself, it is enough if I give you my word to flog and flap myself when I have a mind. It will not do to leave it to thy courtesy, Sancho, said Don Quixote, for thou art heart of heart and, though a clown, tender of flesh, and at the same time he strove and struggled to untie him. Seeing this Sancho got up, and grappling with his master he gripped him with all his might in his arms, giving him a trip with the heel stretched him on the ground on his back, and pressing his right knee on his chest held his hands in his own so that he could neither move nor breathe. How now, traitor, exclaimed Don Quixote. Dost thou revolt against thy master and natural lord? Dost thou rise against him who gives thee his bread? I neither put down king, nor set up king, said Sancho. I only stand up for myself who am my own lord. If your worship promises me to be quiet, and not to offer to whip me now, I'll let you go free and unhindered, if not minus. Traitor and Dona Sancha's foe, thou deest on the spot. Don Quixote gave his promise, and swore by the life of his thoughts not to touch so much as a hair of his garments, and to leave him entirely free, and to his own discretion to whip himself whenever he pleased. Sancho rose and removed some distance from the spot, but as he was about to place himself leaning against another tree he felt something touch his head, and putting up his hands encountered somebody's two feet with shoes and stockings on them. He trembled with fear and made for another tree, where the very same thing happened to him, and he fell a minus shouting, calling upon Don Quixote to come and protect him. Don Quixote did so, and asked him what had happened to him, and what he was afraid of. Sancho replied that all the trees were full of men's feet and legs. Don Quixote felt them, and guessed at once what it was, and said to Sancho, Thou hast nothing to be afraid of, for these feet and legs that thou feelest, but canst not see belong no doubt to some outlaws and freebooters that have been hanged on these trees, for the authorities in these parts are wont to hang them up by twenties and thirties when they catch them, 
whereby I conjecture that I must be near Barcelona, and it was, in fact, as he supposed, with the first light they looked up and saw that the fruit hanging on those trees were freebooters' bodies. Don Quixote Chapter 6739 And now day dawned, and if the dead freebooters had scared them, their hearts were no less troubled by upwards of forty living ones, who all of a sudden surrounded them, and in the Catalan tongue bade them stand and wait until their captain came up. Don Quixote was on foot with his horse unbridled and his lance leaning against a tree, and in short completely defenseless, he thought it best therefore to fold his arms and bow his head and reserve himself for a more favorable occasion and opportunity. The robbers made haste to search Dapple, and did not leave him a single thing of all he carried in the Alforwas and in the valise, and lucky it was for Sancho that the duke's crowns and those he brought from home were in a girdle that he wore round him, but for all that these good folk would have stripped him, and even looked to see what he had hidden between the skin and flesh, but for the arrival at that moment of their captain, who was about thirty minus four years of age apparently, strongly built, above the middle height, of stern aspect and swarthy complexion. He was mounted upon a powerful horse, and had on a coat of mail, with four of the pistols they call petronels in that country at his waist. He saw that his squires, for so they call those who follow that trade, were about to rifle Sancho Panza, but he ordered them to desist, and was at once obeyed, so the girdle escaped. He wanted to see the lance leaning against the tree, the shield on the ground, and Don Quixote in armor and dejected, with the saddest and most melancholy face that sadness itself could produce, and going up to him he said, Be not so cast down, good man, for you have not fallen into the hands of any inhuman Bosiris, but into Roque Guinarts which are more merciful than cruel. The cause of my dejection, re returned Don Quixote, is not that I have fallen into thy hands, O valiant Roque, whose fame is bounded by no limits on earth, but that my carelessness should have been so great that thy soldiers should have caught me unbridled, when it is my duty, according to the rule of night minus errantry which I profess, to be always on the alert and at all times my own sentinel, for let me tell thee, great Roque, had they found me on my horse with my lance and shield it, would not have been very easy for them to reduce me to submission, for I am Don Quixote of La Mancha, he who hath filled the whole world with his achievements. Roque Guinard at once perceived that Don Quixote's weakness was more akin to madness than to swagger, and though he had sometimes heard him spoken of, he never regarded the things attributed to him as true, nor could he persuade himself that such a humor could become dominant in the heart of man, he was extremely glad, therefore, to meet him and test at close quarters what he had heard of him at a distance. So he said to him, Despair not, valiant knight, nor regard as an untoward fate. The position in which thou findest thyself, it may be that by these slips thy crooked fortune will make itself straight, for heaven by strange circuitous ways, mysterious and incomprehensible to man, raises up the fallen, and makes rich the poor. Don Quixote was about to thank him, when they heard behind them a noise as of a troop of horses, there was however, but one, riding on which at a furious pace came a youth, apparently about twenty years of age, clad in green damask edged with gold and breeches. Don Quixote Chapter 6740 and a loose frock, with a hat looped up in the Walloon fashion, tight minus fitting polished boots, gilt spurs, dagger and sword, and in his hand a musketoon, and a pair of pistols at his waist. Roque turned round at the noise and perceived this comely figure, which drawing near thus addressed him, I came in quest of thee, valiant Roque, to find in thee if not a remedy at least relief in my misfortune, and not to keep thee in suspense, for I see thou dost not recognize me. I will tell thee who I am, I am Claudia Geronima, the daughter of Simon Forte, thy good friend and special enemy of Clockle Torellas, who is thine also as being of the faction opposed to thee. Thou knowest that this Torellas has a son who is called, or at least was not two hours since, Don Vicente Torellas. Well, to cut short the tale of my misfortune, I will tell thee in a few words what this youth has brought upon me. He saw me, he paid court to me, I listened to him, and, unknown to my father, I loved him for there is no woman, however secluded she may live or close she may be kept, who will not have opportunities and despair for following her headlong impulses. In a word, he pledged himself to be mine, and I promise to be his, without carrying matters any further. Yesterday, I learned that, forgetful of his pledge to me, he was about to marry another, and that he was to go this morning to plight his troth, intelligence which overwhelmed and exasperated me. My father not being at home I was able to adopt this costume you see, and urging my horse to speed I overtook Don Vicente about a league from this, 
and without waiting to utter reproaches or hear excuses I fired this musket at him, and these two pistols besides, and to the best of my belief I must have. Lodged more than two bullets in his body, opening doors to let my honor go free, enveloped in his blood. I left him there in the hands of his servants, who did not dare, and were not able to interfere in his defense, and I come to seek from thee a safe minus conduct into France, where I have relatives with whom I can live, and also to implore thee to protect my father, so that Don Vicente's numerous kinsmen may not venture to wreak their lawless vengeance upon him. Roque, filled with admiration at the gallant bearing, high spirit, comely figure, and adventure of the fair Claudia, said to her, Come, Sonora, let us go and see if thy enemy is dead, and then we will consider what will be best for thee. Don Quixote, who had been listening to what Claudia said and Roque Guinart said in reply to her, exclaimed, Nobody need trouble himself with the defense of this lady, for I take it upon myself. Give me my horse and arms, and wait for me here. I will go in quest of this knight, and dead or alive I will make him keep his word plighted to so great beauty. Nobody need have any doubt about that, said Sancho, for my master has a very happy knack of matchmaking. It's not many days since he forced another man to marry, who in the same way backed out of his promise to another maiden, and if it had not been for his persecutors the enchanters changing the man's proper shape into a lackey's the said maiden would not be won this minute. Roque, who was paying more attention to the fair Claudia's adventure than to the words of master or man, did not hear them, and ordering his squires to restore to Sancho everything. Don Quixote Chapter 6741 They had stripped Dapple of, he directed them to return to the place where they had been quartered during the night, and then set off with Claudia at full speed in search of the wounded or slain Don Vicente. They reached the spot where Claudia met him, but found nothing there save freshly spilt blood. Looking all round however, they descried some people on the slope of a hill above them, and concluded, as indeed it proved to be, that it was Don Vicente, whom either dead or alive his servants were removing to attend to his wounds or to bury him. They made haste to overtake them, which as the party moved slowly, they were able to do with ease. They found Don Vicente in the arms of his servants, whom he was entreating in a broken feeble voice to leave him there to die as the pain of his wounds would not suffer him to go any farther. Claudia and Roque threw themselves off their horses and advanced towards him, the servants were overawed by the appearance of. Roque and Claudia was moved by the sight of Don Vicente, and going up to him half. Tenderly half sternly, she seized his hand and said to him, Hadst thou given me this according to our compact thou hadst never come to this pass. The wounded gentleman opened his all but closed eyes, and recognizing Claudia said, I see clearly, fair and mistaken lady, that it is thou that hast slain me, a punishment not merited or deserved by my feelings towards thee, for never did I mean to, nor could I, wrong thee in thought or deed. It is not true, then, said Claudia, that thou wert going this morning to marry Leonora the daughter of the rich Balvastro? Assuredly not, replied Don Vicente. My cruel fortune must have carried those tidings to thee to drive thee in thy jealousy to take my life, and to assure thyself of this, press my hands and take me for thy husband if thou wilt, I have no better satisfaction to offer thee for the wrong thou fanciest thou hast received from me. Claudia wrung his hands, and her own heart was so wrung that she lay fainting on the bleeding breast of Don Vicente, whom a death spasm seized the same instant. Roque was in perplexity and knew not what to do. The servants ran to fetch water to sprinkle their faces, and brought some and bathed them with it. Claudia recovered from her fainting fit, but not so Don Vicente from the paroxysm that had overtaken him, for his life had come to an end. On perceiving this, Claudia, when she had convinced herself that her beloved husband was no more, rent the air with her sighs, and made the heavens ring with her lamentations. She tore her hair and scattered it to the winds, she beat her face with her hands and showed all the signs of grief and sorrow that could be conceived to come from an afflicted heart. Cruel, reckless woman, she cried, how easily wert thou moved to carry out a thought so. Wicked. O furious force of jealousy, to what desperate lengths dost thou lead those that give? Be lodging in their bosoms. O husband, whose unhappy fate in being mine hath borne thee from the marriage bed to the grave. Don Quixote. Chapter 6742. So vehement and so piteous were the lamentations of Claudia that they drew tears from Roque's eyes, and used as they were to shed them on any occasion. The servants wept, Claudia swooned away again and again, and the whole place seemed a field of sorrow, and an abode of misfortune. In the end Roque Guinart directed Don Vicente's servants to carry his body to his father's village, which was close by, for burial. 
Claudia told him she meant to go to a monastery of which an aunt of hers was abbess, where she intended to pass her life with a better and everlasting spouse. He applauded her pious resolution and offered to accompany her whithersoever she wished, and to protect her father against the kinsmen of Don Vicente and all the world should they seek to injure him. Claudia would not on any account allow him to accompany her, and thanking him for his offers as well as she could, took leave of him in tears. The servants of Don Vicente carried away his body and Roque returned to his comrades and so ended the love of Claudia Geronima, but what wonder? When it was the insuperable and cruel might of jealousy that wove the web of her sad story? Roque Guinard found his squires at the place to which he had ordered them, and Don Quixote on Rocinante in the midst of them delivering a harangue to them in which he urged them to give up a mode of life so full of peril, as well to the soul as to the body, but as most of them were Gascons, rough lawless fellows, his speech did not make much impression on them. Roque on coming up asked Sancho if his men had returned and restored to him the treasures and jewels they had stripped off Dapple. Sancho said they had, but that three kerchiefs that were worth three cities were missing. What are you talking about, man, said one of the bystanders. I have got them, and they are not worth three reals. That is true, said Don Quixote, but my squire values them at the rate he says, as having been given me by the person who gave them. Roque Guinard ordered them to be restored at once, and making his men fall in line he directed all the clothing, jewelry, and money that they had taken since the last distribution to be produced, and making a hasty valuation, and reducing what could not be divided into money, he made shares for the whole band so equitably and carefully, that in no case did he exceed or fall short of strict distributive justice. When this had been done, and all left satisfied, Roque observed to Don Quixote, if this scrupulous exactness were not observed with these fellows there would be no living with them. Upon this Sancho remarked, from what I have seen here, Justice is such a good thing that there is no doing without it, even among the thieves themselves. One of the squires heard this, and raising the but minus end of his harquebus would no doubt have broken Sancho's head with it had not Roque Guinard called out to him to hold his. Don Quixote Chapter 6743 Hand Sancho was frightened out of his wits, and vowed not to open his lips so long as he was in the company of these people. At this instant one or two of those squires who were posted as sentinels on the roads, to watch who came along them and report what passed to their chief, came up and said, Senor, there is a great troop of people not far off coming along the road to Barcelona. To which Roque replied, Hast thou made out whether they are of the sort that are after us, or of the sort we are after? The sort we are after, said the squire. Well then, away with you all, said Roque, and bring them here to me at once without letting one of them escape. They obeyed, and Don Quixote, Sancho, and Roque, left by themselves, waited to see what the squires brought, and while they were waiting Roque said to Don Quixote, It must seem a strange sort of life to Senor Don Quixote, this of ours, strange adventures, strange incidents, and all full of danger, and I do not wonder that it should seem so, for in truth I must own there is no mode of life more restless or anxious than ours. What led me into it was a certain thirst for vengeance, which is strong enough to disturb the quietest hearts. I am by nature tender minus hearted and kindly, but as I said, the desire to revenge myself for a wrong that was done me so overturns all my better impulses that I keep on in this way of life in spite of what conscience tells me, and as one depth calls to another, and one sin to another sin, revenges have linked themselves together, and I have taken upon myself not only my own but those of others, it pleases God however, that, though I see myself in this maze of Entanglements, I do not lose all hope of escaping from it and reaching a safe port. Don Quixote was amazed to hear Roque utter such excellent and just sentiments for he did not think that among those who followed such trades as robbing, murdering, and waylaying, there could be anyone capable of a virtuous thought, and he said in reply, Senor Roque, the beginning of health lies in knowing the disease and in the sick man's willingness to take the medicines which the physician prescribes, you are sick, you know what ails you, and heaven, or more properly speaking God who is our physician, will administer medicines that will cure you and cure gradually, and not of a sudden or by a miracle. Besides, sinners of discernment are nearer amendment than those who are fools, and as your worship has shown good sense in your remarks, all you have to do is to keep up a good heart and trust that the weakness of your conscience will be strengthened. And if you have any desire to shorten the journey and put yourself easily in the way of salvation, come with me. And I will show you how to become a knight minus errant, a calling wherein so many hardships 
And mishaps are encountered that if they be taken as penances they will lodge you in heaven in a trice. Don Quixote